This week's shout out goes to our one and only Oneida Wands five star NP and just light of the podcast. You, Oneida, you are always so much fun and you're so knowledgeable and you just bring so much to the table and we love you very much. We hope you had a great birthday. We are Christina, Oneida, Alicia, Colleen. Welcome to 4NPs Podcast. This is a podcast by 4NPs, 4NPs, advanced practice nurses, students, and anyone interested in the medical arts. That's the number 4NPs Podcast. If you have a topic you'd like to see covered, please feel free to email us at 4NPsPodcast at gmail.com or reach out to us through our social media. Welcome back to this week's episode of 4NP's podcast. Today's episode is part one of a two-part series where we had the privilege to interview a mentor shared by all four of us. Jill Brennan-Cook is an assistant professor in the ABSN program and a member of the Healthcare in Adult Populations Division at Duke University School of Nursing. She has more than 30 years of nursing experience, including acute, critical care, and emergency department experience. Before working at Duke University School of Nursing, Dr. Brennan Cook served for 15 years as nursing faculty at Mount St. Mary College, where she taught in the undergraduate and graduate nursing programs. She has expertise in nursing education and gerontology. Dr. Brennan Cook is a mentor for ABSN Health Equity Scholars and works closely with members of the Health Equity Academy. Current clinical and research interests include improving care for vulnerable populations, such as frail older adults and patients with myeloproliferative neoplasms and sickle cell disease. Her teaching interests are related to mentoring students and cultivating equity in the classroom and clinical setting. You can see why we're so thrilled to have her with us today. Dr. Cook has a philosophy of nursing. She calls it PIMS, Positive pedagogical approach, inclusivity, mentorship, self-reflection. She tells us a little bit about that today. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Jill Brennan-Cook. We are so excited to speak with you. We've been waiting so long to talk with you. And so uh, thank you so much for coming on our podcast. Well, thank you actually for having me because it's actually, it's really my honor to be here for all of you. Because I remember, well, what I remember, which was a while ago, when you were students, is that you were all so close, and you stuck together, and you supported <laughs> one another throughout all of your learning. And then to, to be in touch with you again, I don't know, years later, and to see that you're all still together, and now you've progressed into nurse practitioner, is really, it's just awesome. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know, but uh, we're all blessed to meet each other and to, um, I think we all helped each other get through both programs. I don't know that I would have made it through without these ladies, so. No, I wouldn't have. Lucky. (laughs) Yeah, I don't think I would have ever went back myself. (laughs) Can I ask you a question? I know you're supposed to be asking me questions, but what is it about what was it about your relationships that drew you together and then still keep you together? I don't know if all of you or a couple of you want to respond, because I think that's the key to surviving a lot of people that I've seen over the years. That's the key to surviving and thriving in nursing school. That's a great question. I don't know. I just think we're, we're super understanding of each other. We support each other. We forgive each other. There's great communication. I think all of those things, not just one in general, right? And we're all different for sure. <laughs> True. But we're all the same in, in the same way, you know? it's We're different, but we're the same. And it's mm-hmm. just, we just are a perfect melody. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. So what you, just, what you just said, Oneida, is exactly what I wrote down some key words, is what is important in nursing. Right. So you said acceptance. We talked about accepting one another. We can't be good nurses without accepting our patients and meeting them where they're at. You said something about forgiveness. 
you know, keeping that open mind because some of our patients will yell and scream at us, but we just forgive and accept. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest things, which is ever so important in nursing is communication, clear communication between professionals, between patients, between everything about the communication has to be clear and it has to be both back and forth. And then you said we're all different and yet we're all the same which is humanity. <laughs> so I just <laughs> asked the question and you just said the most amazing comments, but that's nursing. Yeah. So yeah. I guess you were nurses before you entered school or you had those qualities. Mm. And that's why yeah. you're probably still passionate about it. And yet crusty sometimes also, because it's a complicated profession. Yes. Right. An understatement for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Great question, Jill. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so on that note, what actually brought you to nursing? You know, I I didn't have anyone in my family that was a nurse, nor did I have any role models. I don't remember any nurse in school. I probably was never sick <laughs> and I was never in a hospital. So I actually was really good in math and science and I won some kind of scholarship with SATs or something like that. And somebody said, you should try nursing. And then one of my friend's mothers said, you know, you should get a bachelor's degree because soon they're going to make that obsolete, which of course it still hasn't happened. Right. (laughs) Yeah. And I just decided to become a nurse, but I really didn't have like this burning passion and desire and knowledge for it. And even in nursing school, I had a lot of the same doubts that I hear from all of you and that I've seen within all of you during clinical. I remember studying for the stupidest things, being nervous in clinical, being nervous like for checkoffs or whatever it was. (laughs) Um, And I also was very lucky to have some really bad instructors. So I knew and then followed with some good instructors. And that's where I thrived by having that positive learning experience. And I knew that was like something that was so important. And I didn't know it at the time. I know it now, many, many years later. Yeah. So has it has it been um, like an easier journey for you? What obstacles have you come across um, in nursing? I think I was very lucky because I graduated a million years ago. So I started out in 1985. And one of the really important aspects that I think helped shape my identity in nursing was I started right in the beginning of AIDS crisis. So there was a lot of fear. There was a lot of discrimination. There was a lot of really mean things happening in the world regarding AIDS. Mm -hmm. And many of you can relate to that even with COVID, you know, the fears. Mm -hmm. Um, And also the blame, you Mm -hmm. know, blaming the victim, Mm -hmm. like, well, it's their lifestyle. And we're seeing the same thing going Mm -hmm. on now with a lot of anti-trans agenda, a lot of discrimination in nursing in general. So I think it helped me because I saw people dying alone. Mm -hmm. I saw people, their family members disown them. And then they were, you know, their own close community would come in. But also in the beginning of AIDS, a lot of nurses didn't go in the room. Housekeepers wouldn't clean the room. They would leave the food trays outside. It was really, Mm -hmm. and it was scary because it wasn't, you didn't have the combination therapy at that point. So that was became a real interest of mine early on. I had started off in med surge, went into critical care where I saw these people dying in critical care units. So I just, that influenced the way I practiced early on. Mm-hmm. So I don't think I had a lot of barriers. I had a lot of positive nurturing clinical like preceptors. I was really had a great educator within the health system that I worked at that did a lot of the training and she was an early mentor of mine right from the beginning. I thought, I want to be like her. She, just made, mm-hmm. she was so smart and made everything so simple mm-hmm. when I was first starting mm-hmm. to learn, you know, taking those classes. And then I also was lucky because it was when we had this peak nursing shortage in the late eighties, early nineties. So I was able to hop around to different hospitals. And when I hopped around to those different hospitals, I realized that, Patients are all the same everywhere you go, okay? They really are, right? We're the same and yet different. 
But they all need the same thing and they need the same care. And then I also learned that each hospital functions very differently. And the equipment is kind of very little different, but it's all the same also. Like an IV pump is an IV pump, even though it's a mm -hmm. different company, different brand. You just figure it out and you learn. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that was a great experience for me because I was able to work in a whole bunch of hospitals in the Bronx and White Plains area, Westchester area, like all throughout different parts. And it gave me a great exposure. It was hard. You had to go in. Some days you walked in and you didn't know where anything was. And the patient coded. I mean, you just oh. had to learn where the code part is. And you right. just, you have to be confident mm. and you learn quickly. So like a fake it till you make it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can't fake it in nursing. You could fake confidence. Yeah. But you certainly right. can't fake that's knowledge. what I meant. Yeah. I meant the confidence. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think that's the biggest obstacle is the confidence. Just because yeah. once you get it, you get it, you mm -hmm. know, but it's just getting there. That's, I think, the most difficult. And yeah. I think, um, I worked in a really busy emergency department for a dozen years, and I learned more there than I learned five years prior in several ICUs. Mm -hmm. I learned more in one week in that time. So there was, it was happen, and there was a lot of really great nurses that I worked with, and mm -hmm. you interviewed one of them recently, Linda Ruda. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So. Um, He's awesome. That experience made me also confident clinically. I don't think right. I knew that you and Linda worked together. I don't think I ever knew that. That was how she started working at, at the Mount, yeah. Mount St. Mary at first. Yeah, I do yeah. remember that. You guys are both lucky. I uh, <laughs> said, come on, Linda, let's work. Come on over. And she was, I think she started as a clinical instructor. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, she was great. The positive experience you had with preceptors and other nurses who were supportive along the way, do you think that that's what made you go into education? I, I do. I had that one nurse educator that taught our critical care course, and I thought I wanted to be an educator in a health system, like in a hospital. I never thought I'd go into academia. In a million years, I had never planned it. But you did. And we're glad you did, because we learned I more did. from you. You and Linda both. I mean... You're mm -hmm. both excellent, yes. excellent yes. instructors. And um, yeah. we really felt like something that you said a little bit earlier, where, you know, you come across teachers who maybe just aren't so great. And then you come across the ones that really are and they stick with you. You don't ever forget that. I could still tell some of your stories because I remember them from you teaching us. I can remember like one that I'm not going to share now, but I'll tell you, there was a, you told me the, the worst <laughs> story Ever. Like we, I think we asked you as a class, what was the worst thing you ever saw? And you told us a story about a family that had two tragedies about a year or so apart around Christmas. And I still remember that story and I still get choked up. And then I remember all the other, I remember that uh, President Kennedy had Addison's disease <laughs> because he used to tell us. <laughs> I, I, that's how I, I learned by, I remember from the stories. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, I think, I, um, thank you for the compliment. Um, <laughs> but I think storytelling is really an important part of nursing and education. Um, because it's something we can all relate to. Some of the stories are silly, you know, remembering silly comments from patients or silly moments or stories of when someone is really vulnerable, yeah. you know, where a patient is really vulnerable and where they reach out and just say thank you or something that's so important. So yeah. It's, yeah. But story. And I think I have a silly, I have a great sense of humor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you have to kind of find that twist in nursing too. There's just silly moments and you just have to laugh at yourself because it's okay. It's okay to laugh at yourself right. and not beat yourself up all the time. Cause it's easy to do the other. Oh gosh. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's so true. It sure is. Yes, Alicia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. But yeah. I think um I think one of my most important mentors before I even decided to become a nurse is really my mother. And my mother had nothing to do with healthcare, but she was a really good listener and she was always accepting of everyone and always pointed that out to me if I was in high school and I would complain about something, she would say, "Well, remember, that maybe they have this or maybe this is going on in their lives and, you know, be considerate and be understanding. And I think that's 
really helpful. And part of me, I've never really been, I guess, intimidated by people. And some of that is my mother. And it goes, I can clearly remember I was 16 and I probably told you this story in clinical or something when you were afraid to speak up in clinical, who knows. But when I was 16, I worked in an international bank in Manhattan and I was a kid, you know, I could care less about all the money that they were dealing with. And I didn't really care if I made that million dollar mistake. I knew business wasn't for me because of that, but I was, remember going in for like an evaluation, your annual review. And I remember being so nervous and my mother just said to me, they're no better than you are. They're just a person doing their job. Um, right. And I was like, really, you know, like so confident. And she goes, but with that in turn, <laughs> you're no better than anyone else either. So always remember that. So you don't have to act different in front of someone because of their status or their money or their title or their knowledge. Um, you act the same which sometimes gets me in trouble because I don't always have yes. that deference that other people have. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. <laughs> that was a clear yes, Alicia. Same. Was <laughs> oh, no, same here. Yeah. Not not regarding you, but even in myself, I get in trouble for doing things like that. Sometimes I'm like, oh, okay, I'm supposed to know my place or whatever. But yeah, sometimes. There is no place, right? <laughs> you shouldn't. Your place is exactly where where you are. So. You shouldn't have to feel, especially in healthcare, we have that, some mm -hmm. we used to have when I started, it was very patriarchal mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. in healthcare, it was very hierarchical like approach yes. and you had that power deference right. a lot. So you just have to remember that nobody's ever better than you are. And you're also no better than the, you know, the real unfortunate patient that's homeless with maggots or whatever that you're taking care of. So what would you say to like an, a new uh, nurse starting out who I guess runs up against someone who is part of that hierarchy and um, doesn't see you as, uh, I guess, an equal what, and is treating them poorly? What would you say to them? Like, how should they counter that? Well, I think Oneida, when she talked about communication, I think we have to teach mm -hmm. people the communication to have exactly when mm -hmm. you have those conversations. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. things like, wow, that comment hurts my feelings. Just say it. I say mm -hmm. that even to my kids instead of getting mad at each other. Just say, that hurts my feelings. Mm -hmm. Just say it. Or say, right. help me to understand. Or it feels like you're saying whatever. It feels like you're mm -hmm. not valuing my opinion or you know, I know I don't know a lot. I'm a brand new nurse, but <laughs> can you please help me to understand why you're disregarding what I'm saying or whatever it is. But I think it's good. giving students the right communication tools and actually teaching them to practice it, which in the curriculum that you were in, I don't think there was a lot of room for that then. Mm -hmm. and back a lot of years ago, we, the more we add to a curriculum, yeah. we, we always have to take something out or you don't take out and it just gets stacked and stacked and stacked. And right. really, it's more important for people to learn how to communicate properly. Some of those soft skills or I don't know, what is that what they call them in business? Soft skills. But we talk about the affective domain <laughs> for learning. I think that's more mm -hmm. important than so many other things. Yes. But yes, they still have right. to know cardiac and assessment and your O2 sats, but if you don't know how to communicate with people and respect people, it really doesn't matter, does it? <laughs> yeah, very true. When I taught clinical for the Mount, I had a group of, I don't know, seven or eight, you know, first, first semester was just skills. I'm in the nursing home and I'm, you know, just getting to know them, talking to them a little bit. And they're so young and, so, you know, it's so cute. There's, I love, I love that that yeah. time in nursing because they really <laughs> don't know anything. They know nothing, you know? And I spent the whole, they were surprised. I think they thought like I did when I was a, an RN student that they were going to kind of jump right in to bed baths and, you know, and doing all these procedures and things like that. And so for the first day I went over how to introduce yourself to someone. And that was what I assigned them. I'm like, today is, I want you to go and meet at least two patients, introduce yourself, tell them who you are. And they looked at me like, they're like, we, ha we have to talk to them. 
<laughs> I'm like, yes, you do. <laughs> and I think that's what I loved about it because I, I was so nervous thinking, oh, you know, I hadn't been a nurse that long myself and here, how, how can I possibly teach them? But then when you realize that they're coming in from a place that I've come from, I do have something very basic to teach them that I think will carry them through, you know, and just that, just that basic stuff. And I don't think I had that experience my first uh, clinical, but I was older. I was an older student. So I had life experience behind me. So I wasn't at the same place in life, but to be, you know, 20 years old, like we forget that at 20 years old, they don't have a whole heck of a lot of experience just walking into a room and talking to a patient. They might have experience too. We just don't know. They Some might. Some people are skilled at communicating so clearly. It's a talent yeah. I wish I had. <laughs> yeah, some yeah. of them some of them are, but I I found that the majority of them didn't were not. I think some of them if they had grandparents like I did have one student who had a grandparent that she helped care for. So she was comfortable in the with elderly people and she she did very well. So she didn't really have a problem, but a lot of them they were just very young and you know, they really I think they really appreciated that. I took a little of the pressure off. You know, I kind of gave them the the talk about like you know, you're going to be on this team. So when you have downtime and you're in the break room and you notice there's no more coffee, throw a pot of coffee on for the nurses. You know, you're part of the team. You want to like, that's a nice thing to do. You know, ask ask somebody if, if they need any help. You see somebody given a bed bath, they need a, do they need a, a lift? You know, anything. So I just tried to teach, teach that, that kind of a skill. And I would have, I was a little more thrown in than that. But like I said, I was older, so it was okay. But I don't know. I think sometimes with the younger students, that's something that that they need to like. It becomes a little more basic. I remember Christina asking me, you know, how'd you feel? She knew I was really nervous teaching, and I was like, I realize that it it's more basic stuff than I was thinking. I'm overthinking it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I I do have yeah. some things I can teach. <laughs> so yeah, there's a lot totally. to share because you could share from your experiences and. You know, you can share, you can understand some of the fears and you could be that positive role model that people need to learn. Yeah. yeah. Well, you were definitely that for us. So absolutely. 100%. Yes. Now, what, what made you go on for your, for your DNP? Did you decide you got, you have your DNP or your PhD, your DNP? My DNP. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What made you so, decide to do that? Well, one of the re- the main reason I actually was kind of pushed into it because I wanted to stay as an educator and you have to have a doctoral degree. So I actually looked at a lot of programs, tried to figure out what would work for me. And I was very fortunate because I went with Diane Murphy and Linda Larocco, which both worked. We all went together. So we did similar to what you have all experienced in your friendships. We had so many laughs. Um, <laughs> Fights, not fights, but, you know, frustrating sure. moments and arguments. And mm-hmm. yeah, so we had a lot of great bonding together. And we did that. We did, I did it with an educational focus. And it was great. It was a great experience, but it was hard. It was hard, you know, because you're trying to juggle everything. And it's hard to do that. Mm-hmm. It's hard to work, have kids, balance all those things and go to school. Yeah. And you did that all right before moving, right? No, I finished my doctorate in 2008, I think. Oh, okay. I think that's or what maybe was seven. it. I think that, yeah, you, I don't think you were able to go to our graduation because I think you were also graduating, right? Yes. I think that's what. That's yeah, it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That yeah. was good. Christina. Same time. Oh, wow. I, yeah. I have a memory. I didn't remember that. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. yeah. That was the only one I, I think I remember being upset. Oh, yeah. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> Because that's yeah. actually the best time. Graduation day is so much fun. Yeah. We could go. I could yeah. go back and we could pretend to do it again. Let's do it again. <laughs> we should. We should. That would be fun. Yeah. <laughs> Reenactment. Um, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Ackerman was our voice at graduation. She had. Mm-hmm. She, yeah. She was also wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. She was yeah. a great teacher. Yep. Where is she now? I don't know. I think she's retired. Probably. Yeah. Was she around when we went back? Yeah, that's what I was about to say. She taught the theory, our first theory class or something like that. Oh, 
Oh, she was there. You're right. How do you know what to know? Yeah, knowledge. <laughs> That's what Lots I thought. Lots of knowledge. <laughs> no. Mm-hmm. So, Jill, so in 2007 when we graduated, I know out of a handful of teachers that we completely admired and really enjoyed having, you were like at the top of our list because you were such, I mean, when we talk about role model and inspiration, you were just so authentic and real and down to earth and approachable. Like those are all like real words, you know, just kind of encompassing who you are because it was just so relaxed when we had clinical with you or when we had a class with you and you just came through with so much wisdom and experience and and you still always call us green. Like, you guys are green. You guys are green. Like, we, I was so green. I didn't even know what green meant because it would be like, green? Why is she calling us green? But, like, I knew because we just were so <laughs> naive and we were such novices, right? We had so much to learn. And because mm-hmm. we would just stare at you, like, in the class, like, what? You know? And But, yeah, you were you were definitely one of, one of our, <laughs> our role models, which is why I had reached out to you in 2015 because when I went back for the master's, I was like, where is Jill Brennan? And cook where is she because <laughs> we I did I hadn't realized you had left but um so with that uh, you did transition from New York to North Carolina what made you um make that move well first thanks for the compliments <laughs> you're you're boosted up my ego I'm gonna be um <laughs> Quite confident You're gonna when I, the screen <laughs> yes I need to I need the whole screen <laughs> I won't be able to fit out of my office um <laughs> So I moved to North Carolina mostly because my husband was working down here and he was going back and forth, back and forth. And it was just too stressful at one point Mm. with my kids. They were, you know, getting to be certain ages and it was really hard. So I actually applied for a job at Duke, really not knowing what a phenomenal place it is to work Mm -hmm. and what an opportunity it was. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just, I did homework. I looked up the website, I looked at the schools and, but I didn't really realize how unbelievable it is. Wow. Um, so I was lucky to get there, get a position in the school. I mean, I feel like I mean, belong there and I'm, you know, I need to be there and I'm happy to be there, but I didn't realize how amazing it is. So when you talk about mentors, mm. I work with so many people that are unbelievably phenomenal, that are kind, that are brilliant. Mm. Now, I teach in the ABSN program, the Accelerated Baccalaureate. We also have a master's degree, a um, whole bunch of nurse practitioners, and we have all different specialty tracks. Mm -hmm. So I work with so many nurse practitioners. We also have a DNP program, CRNA, and a PhD. So I work with people that are really awesome, but yet have the same philosophy of teaching where they're kind. They believe in this positive pedagogical approach. They address, you know, microaggressions in the classroom, really focus on inclusivity. Mm -hmm. So many of those important factors like anti-racist behaviors, uh, including that into every aspect of our curriculum. So I'm really lucky to be at a place surrounded by people that have similar values. So that's really nice. Where in other places, there was pockets of us here and there. This is, I I feel very fortunate. Yeah. That's so great. Yeah. And I wish you could all experience the same. Because (laughs) it's pretty, it's pretty, I wish for all of you that you experience that kind of welcoming, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, approach to like when I first got there, I didn't know anybody. Mm -hmm. And people just say, hey, why don't you do this? Or do you want to come here? Or do you want to be at this meeting and see how we run things? Or just really nice nice people (laughs) are just kind, but yet really strong in nursing also. So they're leaders in the, in the profession, they're national speakers, international speakers. They are experts in a lot of fascinating topics that interest me. Actually, when we talked about HIV, I have a lot of friends that are doing research and with people with HIV and Mm -hmm. um, people also doing research with sickle cell disease, which is something that I've always been passionate about for people because I feel like they suffer the worst in all healthcare. Wow. Um, so I'm just lucky. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So I don't know if I answered your question, Alicia, you said yeah. how I got yeah. there. Yeah. 
It, it's amazing. And like everything that I hear you talk about with the level and the caliber of people that you work with and their expertise, and yet it just sounds like they're just all very humble and just staying humble kind of keeps you grounded yes. and relatable and helps you stay teachable, right? Because you know, you never reach a place where you know everything, no matter, you know, you're a world speaker, you're here and you have this specialty, whatever, but there's always something to learn. And it just sounds like you're surrounded amongst some really, really awesome people. So yeah. And thank you for that. I hope, I hope we do all get to experience that because yeah, we all have very different stories, but it's, it is, it's hard to find mentors. It's hard to find people that are as relatable and humble, you know, in, in their area where they're willing to teach you and kind of take you under their wing and, and, and that. So you did go over and describe a couple of things regarding, um, where you are in, in Duke and some of the other levels of programs they have there. What is your specific role there at Duke? So I teach in the ABSN program primarily. I'm affiliated with that program. Mm -hmm. I also am involved in the DNP program. So I mentor DNP students in their scholarly projects which is really a lot of fun. Oh, good. Um, so, and it's right now, it's very challenging for students with COVID. You know, they're trying to mm -hmm. complete their projects and yeah. everything is changing. And so you just have to really reach out to them and check in on them and make sure they're okay. Um, give them that encouragement, but yet be realistic and be able to adapt and adjust according to COVID. Yeah. Um, Yes. We've learned how we to can't, do that. We don't have any other choice, right? Yeah, we've all learned how to do <laughs> yes. that for sure. Yeah, Colleen and I were, that was 2020, February, March, when we were trying to complete our projects. And they actually, we had to redo the whole thing. And we never got to present. We never actually got to do exactly what we were um, scheduled to do. But but the school was supportive, you know, in the end to kind of um, get us what we needed to to just to get us through. Because it, it was kind of like a panic for everybody in those moments there. We had to add some line to our project that said, you know, we had to keep repeatedly keep saying, oh, yes, this did not happen due to due to COVID-19. This did not. Mm -hmm. It was very strange. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I appreciate to I like hearing that there was flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, no. I know for the nurse practitioner students, it was a lot because you really needed clinical hours. You can't just say, mm -hmm. oh, it's OK. Mm -hmm. Um, right. So you had to pivot and adapt for that. And for our ABSN students, I know in the beginning of COVID, it was really hard for me because we were on Zoom, mm. at you know, forever. And my our class sizes are seventy wow. plus. Oh, and oh, wow. having Zoom classes, yeah, is just not effective. Um, and then <laughs> trying to do trying to do clinical. I think we did it for about six weeks clinical on Zoom. So you had to create all these wow. simulations. How do you do that? With difficulty. Okay. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, so you do. Wow. We just had to make videos. Uh, I tried to, like, even YouTube some things. I saw one nurse. She was doing a physical assessment on her dog in the house. You know, oh, <laughs> it's like, wow. this is a physical assessment. And that made me laugh. So <laughs> we would, I did, we did a lot of online programs. You know, they have those simulated programs. We did a lot of that. Then we did small group work where you talk through the cases, mm -hmm. and but it required a lot more hours and a lot more time. So sure. everyone was exhausted. Yeah, yeah, and and mad. Yeah, <laughs> Frank, cranky. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but oh, we're right. past that. We've been back in the classroom, back in clinical, and all that. So that's. I remember being on one of the Zoom classes with you, Colleen, and somebody was drinking a glass of wine. <laughs> Yeah, she was just, just kind of like leaning. <laughs> she was drinking a glass. Then we had another one I that hope it wasn't your teacher. <laughs> and then we'd have another one that was on her exercise bike, and she's like, "Oh, don't mind." I mean, it was just anything you could do to relieve the stress. <laughs> it was just so funny. <laughs> we were we were That's cracking. Hard. Alicia and I would be texting each other. We're like, what is she doing? <laughs> like she's wearing her bathrobe. One would show up like in her pajamas. Yeah. Like you know, she had her bathrobe and her like and blankets all over. We're like, are you really? You can't throw a shirt on to come to class. Yeah. Like you're like, we're not your friends. You wouldn't be drinking the bottle really funny, in though. class. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, we were true. like, you know, why not? I mean, you're home all day. <laughs> <laughs> it's like just get me through this making the most no was it nine in the morning yeah yeah so i so working there has been nice um i also 
I teach right this semester. I'm teaching the first semester students and it's a professional. They have four professional courses. Okay. And this is past, present and future. So it is awesome. Nice. Um, right now we're on current issues, which could be an entire semester. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, so I try to do, it's a professional course. So we talk about like joining professional organizations. We talk about how to create your own kind of like philosophy of how you want to practice. And Sweet. it's really, it's a great experience. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I also teach, I've been coordinating the gerontological nursing course. Oh, well. So we didn't have that when I used to teach where, where you were. Right. But mm -mm. it is so needed. Um, oh, so, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. I had to quickly become an expert and take every single training and course about gerontological nursing that I could ever imagine. So that's been really rewarding because I get to work with a lot of fun people and we've created some gero review courses for nurses. Even we work with a lot of different practices. I take them to students go to what are they called? Like program for all inclusive care for the elderly PACE programs. Oh, wow. And they oh, learn wow. just all about geriatrics and gerontolo gerontology. Very and then good. I also work with a lot of nurses from GAPNA. So I don't know if any of you are involved with the Gerontological Advanced Practice Nursing Association. No, no. Mm -mm. So I'm actually joined even as a nurse, um, even though it's advanced practice, because I just, I get to, you know, go to different courses and programs. And they actually have something coming up that I wanted to go to. I think it's, I could do it on Zoom because it was pharmacology oh. for nurse practitioners. Yeah. But I would love to get that just to go to their conference to learn that. Yeah, totally. that would be great. Mm -hmm. I actually would be interested in that myself. So is that all through, yeah. that's not, that's through the organization? It's through GAPNA. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're going to, yeah. we'll put a link in our show notes to that. Oh um, yeah, but, definitely. And yeah. the Hartford too um, foundation is okay. really okay. great. Um, the National Hartford Center for Gerontological Nursing Excellence okay. is also a great resource. So those two um, are phenomenal because they have tons of online learning programs that you could do. Uh, one of my one of my division director was the president, so that's how I got involved. Just learning about more of it, and now I think there's probably a few people I work with that are on the board somewhere. Uh, but it's been really you could get a lot of resources for you as nurse practitioners if you're interested. Yeah, we should do that. Interested? Yeah. All like, all your patients are old. <laughs> yeah. Unless you're in peds. Yeah. No. Very true. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely not in peds. <laughs> not for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Jill, I mean, that sounds amazing. And I know you said that the class sizes are pretty large. What do you find to be the most challenging, not necessarily with the size, but maybe with the, um, the topics or, you know, with the class size, is there anything in specifically that you find to be ch a challenge for, for, for what you're doing? I think the hardest part for me when I first got there was transitioning to a, a university that was more research yes. intensive yes. and um, multi-center university. So your focus is on scholarship is really that has to be present. Mm. So in a teaching intense university or college, your focus is on teaching, teaching, teaching. But when you're in a bigger center or a research intense university, you have like three pillars. So you have to focus on scholarship and service and education. So only a smaller portion of what you do is actual teaching. Wow. You have to constantly be contributing and reevaluating yourself to try to be better. So sometimes that could be frustrating, but it's also the best part about it, right? Because you're always challenged. Right. Always learning. So yeah. always learning. Yeah. And, and that's some of the hardest parts because I could go to a class or a conference every single day hmm. and learn something and I actually limit myself to once a week because I get overwhelmed with like signing up for everything <laughs> like yeah. oh they have this today this today and that today um, wow. there's so many opportunities to be involved that you have to limit yourself does that include a clinical okay. setting or the clinical settings because I'm, I'm right in the triangle so for students they have the duke system which is you know three big hospitals and then all the outpatients and then they have UNC system, which is vast. And then we also have another wake med system. So they have a big opportunities for clinicals. And actually almost all of our graduates go into acute care right off the bat. 
Wow. wow. Which is, well, that says a lot. That you have yeah. to yeah. accept. I mean, it's what they want. So they come in mm -hmm. knowing this is what I want. And um, yeah, it's a lot. And yeah. many go right on to NP school mm -hmm. within a few years, really right after or within a few years. Now, I remember, and this is going to at some point tie into my a little bit uh, of my next question, too. When we were, when Alicia talked about being green, um, and I could sympathize, I was very green. <laughs> and so green that there was a specific moment when we were in clinical at Vassar, you were giving us our assignments for the day. And I believe it was Alicia that I was, she was in our little group. And I remember not wanting to disappoint you at all. <laughs> so you had spoken, you were giving me, uh, giving us a breakdown of some of the patients. And one of them, you had mentioned that they had CA. And I shook my <laughs> yeah. head like, of course, yes. And after that, Alicia pulled me aside and she was like, Oneida, what, what is CA? And I'm like, I have no idea. And she looked at me. She's like, but you shook your head. And I'm like, of course I did. It was Joe Cook. I'm not going to. I'm sorry. It was, it was the funniest moment because Alicia looked at me like she really wanted some of the knowledge that I seemed to, she thought I had. Yes. I'm like, oh, shoot. I'm really missing this. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> um, but do you at all still even teach in the clinical setting like that or not in the past five years? So that's yeah. the hardest part about where I am because oh. I miss that more than anything. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you're so good also, at it. <laughs> well, I, I will be back. I will soon. Um, I, so in the beginning of COVID, I was ready to go back into practice again and try to work one day a week somewhere or one day, every other week, something. But it took me a long time to get acclimated here, mm -hmm. getting our kids situated, yeah. just adapting. Mm -hmm. And then I finally felt ready and then COVID happened. Mm -hmm. So I'm just thinking this summer would be where I would, when I would like to go back and practice. Yeah. Um, but that I miss, I miss a lot yeah. uh, because that's where you see those small teachable moments. Yes. In yeah. the big classroom, you, you don't always yes. get them. Yeah. And I, I prefer the clinical setting for learning mm -hmm. yeah. well you'd be a great asset yeah. to yes, those students for sure. oh yeah you know once that happens <laughs> so <laughs> for sure yeah but for um sure. but we I do get into like I go and check in on students we can go to clinical sites and I could go sometimes I'll go to their post conference especially if it's at an ice cream place because <laughs> now with COVID we try you know we step out of the clinical arena and have it outdoors or something like that yeah wow um, great so I would, I, I don't mind that, but I do miss being in acute care too. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, that's where you started, right? In the yeah. ICU? Yeah. 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 Your love. You said most of the students go straight to acute care. Uh, do they do well in acute care? Because it sounds like your program really prepares them yeah. um, for at least the basics of what they're going to encounter. Well, every state is different on how they, what they expect of their curriculum. So here, every student does a preceptorship for their final semester. Mm -hmm. So many of them do a preceptorship in the emergency department or in the ICU, the surgical ICU, the neuro ICU, the cardiac or cardiothoracic or pediatric ICU or neonatal intensive care. So they do all these preceptorships. And very often that steps into a position in that, in that area. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean it it has to be you can be a preceptorship in one unit and still apply for mm -hmm. another unit mm -hmm. but good. right now I tell them all the time if you have a pulse you're going to get a job don't worry about it so <laughs> yeah but they still stress and they'll apply for like seven jobs all over the country because they they come wow. here from all over the country right. and yeah. they live here for 16 months and I'm amazed that they're I guess being brave and just being willing to hop they, you know, they want to go to the Mayo Clinic or they want to go to Johns Hopkins or they want to stay at Duke because they want to go mm. to that, you know, big name yeah. no. uh, healthcare mm. facility. And I'm amazed that they just ha have the resources to, or the wherewithal, because you could do everything online, find an apartment, find a group or find a roommate. And it's just amazing. But some of them are applying, even right now, there's students, because they all have jobs already for May. And 
some of them are getting offers. And I said, I told you not to apply to that many places. Right. You're going to get offers for all of them. Right. Now you have to make a big decide. decision. That's so, yeah. it sounds yeah. like such a great program. It sounds really amazing. Yeah. I think all a lot of programs that we offer nowadays are probably a lot better because we're more, I guess, comfortable teaching outside the box. Mm -hmm. I think, right. you know, when I went to school, you had to do a certain way. And for a long time, we taught a certain way. Yeah. You know, I think simulation has changed a lot too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, standardized patients where they hire people to be patients. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to do when I'm retired. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> um, Anne-Marie uh, Eubing did that at the Mount. She instituted that in the NP program yes. for our clinical exams. That was yeah. our final. Yeah. And it's great because she, you know, she's very supportive of veterans. So she got in with the veteran community and she brings veterans in for your assessment. And it's fantastic. Oh, I love it. Yeah, it's really I great. And it would be great to do your clinicals at a VA center too, where yeah. it's needed for a nurse practitioner. Yeah. Yeah. I, for me, yeah. I, if I could pick my perfect place for a to be a nurse practitioner, I would just want to practice. That's like mostly little old men with a couple of cute little old ladies thrown in there. I would love a practice with, I love the old men. So <laughs> they'd love you too. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Foreign Peace Podcast has a Facebook group called Nurse Business, a community created to support one another and enjoy positive ideas and thoughts. We hope you'll join us. In addition to that, for a little fun, follow us on TikTok. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to see some clips of our live interviews and listen to past episodes. Feel free to email us with ideas for episodes, comments about our podcast, to recommend an interviewee, or if you'd like to be interviewed yourself at 4NPspodcast at gmail.com. That's the number 4NPspodcast at gmail.com. Please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at 4NPspodcast. That's the number 4NPspodcast. Subscribe to us wherever you get your podcast and go to our website at 4NPspodcast.com for episode transcripts, resources, and more information about us. Thanks for listening. Please join us in two weeks to listen to part two of our interview with Jill Brennan Cook, our mentor. We'll learn about who her mentors are and we'll discuss the importance of remembering why you're a nurse. Have a great two weeks. The information in this podcast is for educational purposes only and should not be used in substitute for professional care by a medical provider. The information in this podcast does not represent medical or other professional advice or services. The thoughts and opinions presented on the 4NPs podcast are of the hosts and guests and do not represent those of their employers.